So, you know, I always wanted that kind of hunger, you know. But um, I think also there's, a, there's a, actually a bigger issue which I come across with cul uh, in, across culture here. And I'm going to try and address this in some shape or form. I don't know how to do it yet. And that is that uh, Liverpool is great at throwing up people I've thrown up creative thinkers, actually, right? But it is run by a lot of guys who were born slightly after 1949, and they don't understand the technology, right? And I am now in different forums, different places, trying to get them to accept that we need to be getting, we really need to be getting all of our kids and young people and saying, to like, will you forget all this nonsense, this old-fashioned stuff, and focus on telecommunications and iPhone apps and all the rest of it. At the ICDC, we ran a thing called Mobile Movies, and it was a social inclusion uh, project funded for a while. We took kids in and showed them how to shoot movie on a mobile phone, only using mobile phones. Right? And they were fantastic. Two and a half minutes, 90 seconds, depending on the capacity of the phone. They were great, and one of them was about a guy whose uh, mate had died, a young 18, 19 year old. He just shot it at this park bench where him and his mate used to mix, and it was just really moving, just all on a mobile, you know, it's great. And my best one, which I was talking about, was Cat Cam. And that was where this girl, a 14-year-old girl, had taken a mobile, set it on video, and strapped it to the head of a cat, <laughs> and sent it out, you know. And <laughs> it's just fantastic. And this cat on 22 stories up on a, it's about to jump from one balcony to another. And uh, you know, and, and you see that, you see the, it's doing this, you know. The, <laughs> it was brilliant. but. And, and that, I think, would have, been, that would have been a great download, you know. And I think she would have made quite a lot of cash on that. And this is the other thing, this is what I mean about, somehow or other I'm going to have to try and get more and more talk about this, because you do your, twi you do your 30 minutes, you do your two minutes, you can do, even do your 45 seconds. And the micro-payment economy, you know, get it in the right place, get it at the right time, get it downloaded, and you're going to turn over more money then you'll, you'll do wasting five years trying to shoot a movie or wasting three years trying to call commissioning editors in broadcast, you know, so. And it's all about telling stories and content and then you'll go from two minutes to 30 minutes to 60 to 90, you know, you'll find that route will just develop itself as people get more confidence, more ability and, and more aspiration, you know, so. Mm. Mm. Have you got any tweeters at all? Any tweeting messages come through? On the other side. I mean, a classic. There's, there's, there's a few here. Um, <laughs> there's, there's some comments, Phil, and um, one is that, uh, well, I suppose this is a question, but it's can we have a Brookside show uh, where bands get to play on Trevor Jordassi's patio? <laughs> <laughs> and the crap ones get buried. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and if not, then can you do Brookside 3D as, uh, as another one? <laughs> but um, well, someone's asked a serious question, and it's, um, it's about, about Hollyoaks and its use of music. Um, so Hollyoaks is great for using new music, but do you think that the music industry and the TV industry should work together more and, and use new music rather than chart to see if, if the two can have synergy that breaks bands? Uh, the answer is yes. I mean, and the reason why Hollyoaks uses new music is the, is the royalty and residual structures that make it very expensive trying to use chart things. I mean, I watched, <laughs> I watched the... Uh, whatever it was, anniversary of EastEnders, the live show, you know. Because I, I watched it with a couple of the kids and said, uh, come on, let's watch this and I'll show you where they get it wrong, you know. Right? <laughs> and actually, I have to say, technically, it was really good because they did all the things of having two shots, three shots and all that. And I really felt sorry for them because they got right to within 90 seconds. There was a few dodgy uh, mis misfocuses and moves and that, but... They got to within 90 seconds of the end and then the camera bumped into somebody and they got the, you know, the thing. But while watching it, I still got irritated by the fact that the BBC can play the top 10. <laughs> that EastEnders can pull the top 10 because they've got their blanket PRS license. You know? So it's another kind of issue about, um, yeah, it'd be terrific if everybody would do new music, but that's not the reason why they do it. You know, and it, it's a, there's a legal, you know, pragmatic structure around it. And that takes you on to another issue, which is about downloading. And I was in a, 
working group in London arguing with Fergal Sharkey, you know. And if you think I talk a lot, you want to get a room with Fergal. And now everyone knows never to put the two of us in the same room together, you know. But he was going on about uh, musicians' need to be uh, compensated uh, for the illegal downloads. All it was one of these debates, and he came out with this great line, which was that, you know, there's 12 million tracks on iTunes and only about 2,000 ever get listened to. Right? And this is outrageous, Phil. <laughs> I feel like that's telling you something. Right. That is telling you that the audience, the consumers, only want 2,000. Right. The fact that they've got 12 million available to them is fantastic. But if they don't want it, you can't then go round to consumers and say, you've got to download that track because these people deserve a thing. So it's a harsh, re that's a harsh reality, but that's something else we've got to take it back. The thing about your comment about being a nerd because you buy an album, we were forced to buy albums, weren't we? Because that's the way they made the cash back, you know. So you, how, many how many of us have got an album with, there's only one track on it that we really like, you know. Right. You know. And I fell for it the other day too. I was out somewhere and I was listening to something and I said, what's that? And I said, that's a really great track, what's that? And they said, oh, it's Pink Floyd, it's off the wall. And I was never into Pink Floyd. And I thought, oh. Well, I'll, I'll buy the album because, you know, The Wall, all this sort of thing. <laughs> we don't need no all that. So I bought it, found the track. I then realised why I didn't buy the rest of the album. You know, when I had early on, you know, because there's a couple of good tracks, but it's not my type of music. So, and that's great about iTunes. I go, get me track, that's it. And if you look at it the other way, people will go, oh, God, you know, what that means. Well, actually, for a band, it's great. You only have to go in the studio and make three tracks. You don't have to make 12 tracks. Mm -hmm. One final question. Um, what, have you got any big regret that you've done in your telly life? Nothing that I haven't worked through in counselling and come out of. Okay. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Phil Redmond. Yeah.